Hello, everyone, and welcome back. I'm here with my friend, Keith Reeves. We are the Seditionists. Uh, this will be our July episode, and um, we've had, we just came back from ISTE 2016, where you saw our previous episode of us being uh, live in Colorado. So even though uh, Keith and I have been doing this show now for a year, um, we've only really met each other face to face two or three times. So again, it's the beautiful power of technology. We, we become really close friends, but we've only seen each other flesh and blood a few times. Uh, but we had a great time at ISTE. Uh, I'll let Keith mention a few things there as well. Uh, however, one thing that we did notice at ISTE that we were considering is possibly rebranding ourselves. Um, we are seditionists. We will always be seditionists, uh, but that might not be the easiest title uh, for our video blog. Um, so if you have any opinions on that, we'd really like to hear from it, some, some suggestions, some ideas of what we could do in terms of a, a new title. Um, just put it down below in the comments section, uh, or feel free to email either one of us or tweet to either one of us and uh, give us some opinions. Uh, also, if you get an opportunity, please don't forget to subscribe, again, down below there, uh, to, our, to our regular uh, video podcast. And if you have any themes or suggestions that you'd like us to take up and, and, and think about and discuss and debate, uh, put those also in the comment section. We'll be more than happy to pick up on those ideas and, and sort of kick them around a little bit. So how you been, Keith, after Colorado, buddy? Not bad. No altitude sickness this time, so that was good. Um, I must say it's the first educational technology conference I've gone to that I wasn't presenting at. Um, I presented at ISTE last year in Philadelphia, and uh, it was really interesting to be able to just kind of uh, absorb ideas, really have some in-depth conversations with people. Um, I really enjoyed that. So uh, I've already started putting in my proposals for VISTE in December, so I'll be back on the presenting trail before too much longer. And for those of you that aren't aware, in October at UVA Wise down at the Southwestern Virginia Leadership Center. Um, Rob and I will be doing a co-keynote with Steve Staples, who is the uh, Superintendent of Instruction for the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, Rob and his uh, excellent uh, speaking schedule will actually be uh, live streaming in from elsewhere in Virginia. Um, but we, we are hitting the ground running come the fall. So I, I enjoyed having a little bit of time off to sit back and be able to talk to some of our colleagues. Um, and in the course of having uh, those conversations, Rob and I came up with something that we think might be one of those practical solutions people often asked us for um, to help talk about individual empowerment of the student voice. Rob? Yes, one thing that we were that we were discussing a lot was um, obviously the, the need for a, an educational revolution and that conversation stemmed into well how does that start? How do you get an educational revolution to start? Uh, the conversation was obviously uh, at the state level, it's federal level, uh, administration at the district level, teachers, um, and, and Keith and I are both in agreement, I think, that really none of those places are where you're going to start a quality uh, revolution. You've got to start with, with, with the people that you're engaging, and, and that's the students. Uh, the students have to be the ones that stand up and say, we don't, we're not effectively being educated in the way that we need to be. Um, as 21st century uh, students and, and eventually the adults that will govern this world, we need it a different way. And they're the ones that have to start uh, this revolution. And uh, I think Keith and I have, a, have an idea as to how that can happen. Um, I'll let Keith kick it off first. Go ahead, Keith. The idea that we're talking about today is student unions. Um, and Rob and I both have pretty extensive experience with unions, uh, in both good and bad. Um, just as an anecdote, I, I've been a union leader um, and I've also been a union member. Um, I've been part of great unions that were extraordinarily proactive and were really invested and interested in forwarding and advancing the mission and the empowerment of all of the members. And I've been member uh, a member of just the worst kind of union that we've all heard of, where it's about nepotism and keeping people in power who don't belong there and obfuscation. There's pros and cons to everything. But the idea of a student union is really centering around the notion that grassroots empowerment of the student voice is critical and important. At the same time, and I think Rob and I are both in this milieu because we both went from being music teachers to being administrators, there's also something powerful about people with authority using that authority for the larger good. 
right? The problem, of course, and you've probably noticed that both Rob and I tend to be anti-authoritarian, is that too much of one can often counterbalance the good of the other. The idea of the student union is to try to find a compromise in that middle space, empowering the student voice, ensuring that their needs are met, and taking those concerns seriously. Not just paying lip service to them and saying, oh, we're going to hand out a survey and see how our kids feel. Not just how they feel. What do they want? How do they want it? What can we do to better meet the individual needs of our individual students and empower them to create some of those solutions? And and, and you're absolutely right. I, I've been in uh, certainly my fair share of, of, of wonderful unions. And as an administrator, I think the unions I deal with on a regular basis are fantastic. Um, because they've got their head on right, that they're they're here for, for for the right reasons. Um, being a Pennsylvania boy, you know, unions really started here, um, uh, and and actually just about thirty five minutes away is was was the one of the uh, showcase uh, areas of the start of the unions in the coal mines. Um, so my family has a long history of of of, of being a a part of a union. But let's think about the word union and, and why did they create unions? They created unions because the workers, or in, in this in this, uh, in this this case, we'll, we'll call them the bottom rung, that group was, was not getting what they needed. They needed safer uh, situations, safe, safer um, work areas. They, ne they needed uh, fair pay. They, they they needed the ability to 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 uh, if they're sick to be able to go and get health care those type of things. So what we're saying is we're saying the bottom rung of the association, the bottom rung of the organization, is is are, are got together, banded together, and said, leadership, you, we need this in order to do our job and function properly. So all I'm saying is take that exact same concept. So all of you people that are very pro-union, I'm agreeing with you. Take that exact same concept and put it in our, we'll call it the bottom rung here, even though I'm not real great with that term. It's the best I can call it at the moment. Um, but take our bottom group and, 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 and say the same thing to them. But here's where the problem is. People think the bottom rung or the, or the lowest part of the organization is the teacher. It's not. The students are there. So that's the ones that they have to say to us. They need to say to us, teachers, principals, administration, here are the things we need in order to work properly. Their work is to learn. Their work is to grow. But it's still their job right now. So as a student union, we are saying, as an organized body, we are saying these are the things we need. We need to be taught 21st century skills. We need to be taught in an exploratory discovery type of way, whatever it might be. The students have the voice, and they're the ones that we should be listening to, just like a teacher's union, just like a, a, a worker's union in a coal mine. They need to collectively get together and say, as an organized body, in order to do our job better or the best we can, this is what we need. And I think people should listen. Absolutely. Having an independent student voice um, is actually not all that unusual outside of the United States. Here in the United States, and I may be preaching to, to the choir a little bit here, many people may already know this, but oftentimes people hear student union. In the United States, it usually refers just to a physical structure, often on a college campus. Well, that's not how it is in many other parts of the world. The student union is, in fact, a representative body, independent of the faculty and representing the students. I see no good reason why that model ought not be applied to K-12 education here in the United States. As Rob accurately pointed out, empowering the students to say, this is what I need, this is what we feel we need, and the way in which we feel we need it, is something that may seem revolutionary to our traditionally institutionalized industrial era K-12 model, but it really works very well in other parts of the country where the student voice, excuse me, other parts of the world where the student voice is taken more seriously. Um, if we believe in the democratization of education, a phrase that's often used by critical pedagogues and radical pedagogues alike, then ought we not empower the very people we are here to serve with the ability to express what they want in an independent fashion without fear of reprisal. Um, Doris Kearns Goodwin is credited with saying that that is effectively what good le leadership looks like, is surrounding yourself with people who you can disagree with without the fear of reprisal. Students don't have that in most schools. If a group of students band together to express to the faculty or to the leadership, this is what we say we need. 
very often leaders will come down hard on them with that authoritarian autocratic kind of you're here to do your just sit down and back in the bus there. That's not what this building is for. I am apt to say on a regular basis that this building, my paycheck, everything in my office, my career, we exist by, for, and of children. That's why we're here. So why on earth do we not listen to them? Now, there is an often made counterpoint that we will hear from people who say, well, I don't want kids making decisions for schools. Well, why not? A, what are you so afraid of in the relinqu relinquishing of control? But B, there is actually research on this, and I invite you all to Google it, that says that kids don't come up with these crazy, off-the-wall, nonsensical, hyper-emotional, they're going to hate their word, you know, teachers they don't like. We have data that shows that that isn't true. And I think that operating on the basis that that is what's going on, not only flies in the face of research, but betrays a rather serious mistrust of children. If, if we believe in children, we ought to trust them and empower them. Absolutely. Well said, Keith, well said. Because um, you know, as you were talking, you were talking about the, uh, the idea of the student voice and uh, us not taking it seriously. That certainly becomes the faltering point here, because um, I, I think that's really when it comes down to it, the only reason why adults would, would say this isn't something that would work because the kids would give you uh, unrealistic responses, unrealistic answers. And, and, and again, it's, it's that lack of having faith and trust in them because you know, whenever and I'm an elementary principal, so I'll take this in an elementary slant. We always tell the teachers, let them, let them create the rules for the classroom. You know, they make them so much harder than we would because, because they're very literal and very serious in their intent to do it right. So I think this, this the same thing would happen with a student union, where the students would get together, band together, come up with these things. They would actually be more rigid in, in, in their needs and, and, and desires and, and wants in terms of uh, creating a better education for them. The, the, the frustrating part is the fact that the adults don't seem to want to either, it's either not want to give up the, 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 the power, like you said, or they're afraid of the outcome. But even at the end of the day, even the outcome can be controlled. Even at the end of the day, you can, you can, you can work with them and you could say, okay, this is what the students are telling me. This is what the teachers are saying. This is what administration is saying. Let's all get together and have this conversation about what we're going to do to make it better. Because at the end of the day, it is all about the kids. And I think so many times people forget that, that they're more concerned about how their work day is going, you know, as opposed to how are they working with the kids? It seems so counterproductive. Keith. You know, and those of you who know my work and I think both of our work um, will be unsurprised to hear me say that I, I tend to be pretty anti-corporate. Um, I don't like um, the introduction of corporate interests into the public sphere, particularly where children are concerned. That having been said, there is a study that was co-funded by the Gates Foundation called the MET study. I forget exactly what the acronym stands for. But one of the most telling things that came out of my reading of the analysis of the MET study was, and I think the sentence, this is not a direct quote, but it's almost verbatim, is that students know an effective classroom when they experience one. They know. And the data shows that that they know. So to say, well, we can't trust them, we don't want their voice, to me is very counterproductive and, and very silly. But moreover, you know, if we are to uh, teach with relevance, if we are to meet our students where they are, which is something we hear bandied about all the time from teacher preparation programs to professional development settings, if we're going to do that, we have to know what they think. We have to know how they feel. We have to know what they say. We have to know the way in which they say it. Relevance to the child is one of our, making things relevant to the child, is one of our professional, if not ethical, responsibilities. What better way to make that happen than to empower students to have an authentic voice, to uplift and amplify that voice and then to take it seriously. I do think that that independence of voice would be critical for that to happen. I've I kind of dabbled with the idea of trying to get things like this to happen in other schools before and oftentimes you'll hear people say, well, we already have a student government that's representative. But is it? Because I find that many student governments are really they have a pretty heavy handed faculty influence or just kind of operate on the periphery on the side. We don't really take it seriously. You know, if your classroom representative and you can pick the colors for the float, but why not give kids the opportunity to say, I think that we can do better with this particular aspect of curriculum. I trust them to do that. 
Absolutely. And I think you hit, you hit, a, you hit an interesting nail on the head here. Uh, how, how do we create this student union to have enough impact that it will be taken seriously? Um, so so uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is like the opt out uh, movement. And I believe that's Seattle. Great example. Uh, they sort of are, in a way, at least in, in my head, uh, unionizing. I mean, they're, they're coming together, they're banding together, they're saying, we don't, we don't like this, it's not productive for us as students. And that's sort of a, a model for, for what, for what I, at least I see, I envision. Um, so I, I think that's sort of where this student union thing needs to start is we got to give them a little bit of, of, of I don't want to say power, but we have to give them a, a motive um, to, be, to be listened to. Um, you know, for example, you know, with the opt out movement, well, you're going to listen to us or we're going to opt out of this test. So we need to come up with a national type of thematic concept. Maybe it would even be that mm -hmm. uh, or something like that, where the where the students can say, look, we need you to listen to us. But if you're if you're un unwilling to listen to us, here are going to be some of the things that, that, that we need to that we need to consider before we whatever, you know, take the test, do the teaching, do the student, whatever. What mm -hmm. do you think? I agree. I'm stunned by educational leaders at all echelons of the educational community who say, you know, well, we, we can't have students organizing and protesting and collective action. That is the fundamental legacy of the United States as society. The fundamental aspect of Americanism, regardless of your social sociopolitical views, it started with revolution. It started with saying, this isn't right, and we're going to do something about it, right? So I have no fear of collective student action. Do we not have a responsibility to help amplify that voice? Now, I'm not saying that every little protest suddenly becomes the entire, that's going to be the obsession of the school. But to the contrary, something as legitimate and serious as the opt-out movement, where all of the research says standardized testing is crap. Students don't want it. Parents don't want it. Schools don't want it. Administrators and legis the legislators don't want it. And finally, they said, you know what? I'm sorry. You won two plutocrats and autocrats who say you're going to do it. You don't have the power we have the power and it was a collective action it wasn't unilaterally student oriented students teachers parents all together uh, if anybody is unfamiliar with the mechanisms of how this got off rob hit the nail on the head seattle is where it started garfield high school in seattle washington led in part by jesse hagopian and many of his colleagues if you're not familiar with the book more than a score i encourage everybody to check it out it's kind of a collection of of uh, works that jesse put together it can happen and did happen in a meaningful way to the point that the legislature had to concede. It is possible for a sea change led by students if it's done in a thoughtful uh, way, in a collective action. Um, you know, at a smaller scale, there's nothing to say we can't do that starting off in our classrooms, right? In my classroom in Port Byron, New York, my first job uh, right out of college, I was regularly trying to empower students to say, what do you want? get them together, organize. They said, this is what we want to do. Um, you know, we haven't had a marching band in forever. Well, I was forbidden from spending dime one on the marching band, but the kids wanted it. So within the constraints that was laid out in front of me, I got uniforms donated. We got the, the a custodian helped me to put a bass drum stand together out of bent metal. We did all sorts of things on a voluntary basis to make it happen. That was one of those little moments of collective action. Once students get a taste of that, that they can control and change and enhance their learning, we're not just talking about like, you know, knocking over barrels and setting fires in the streets. We're talking about fundamentally improving the quality of teaching and learning at a school. They get a taste of that, they realize that applies across the board. We adults who agree have the opportunity to enhance that and make it happen. And the student union could be one of the ways that we make that happen. Excellent. I couldn't agree more. And I think you uh, hit the nail on the head there, Keith, and we're going to wrap it up right there. Um, the, next, the next thought is, how do we get this started? And maybe we'll even attack that in, in our next uh, video cast. Or if you, uh, the listeners, have any idea of how we could get this uh, movement started, uh, add comments down below. And also, uh, don't forget to subscribe to us so you could keep, uh, keep going and listening to more of, of Keith and I. Um, and then finally, again, a, a repeat from the beginning, if you come up with any good uh, branding name for us, right now we do call ourselves the, the Seditionists. And 
any suggestions in there, uh, please leave them in the comment box below. Uh, thank you very much, Keith, for, for uh, hanging out with me Pleasure today. as always. Here, yep. And um, I'm going to let Keith wrap it up. This is Rob Furman saying goodbye. And this is Keith Reeves. If you guys don't already follow us on Twitter, and again, as Rob said, please subscribe down below. We appreciate it. Always looking for comments. Um, be sure to check out our websites because uh, we've got a couple of books on sale, and it's talking about the sort of stuff that we're talking about. Until next time, Rob Furman, Keith Reeves, The Seditionists.